Welcome back to part 2 of Playdate Programming for Beginners. If you haven't programmed a single line in your life, this video is for you. Also, if you have experience but you're new to Lua, this video will be pretty helpful in introducing Lua-specific concepts as well. If you haven't checked out part 1, make sure to do that. This time, we'll be covering tables, loops, and Playdate SDK specifics. Let's get right into it. Imagine this scenario. You have a bunch of enemies in the game and need some way to keep track of their health. What do you do? Well, with just the information that I've taught you so far, you might think to create some variables for it. Sure, but the number of enemies might change, or you might have 100 enemies. I think you can see how this can get out of hand very quickly. Let's consider another scenario. You have an inventory, and the name of the currently selected item is stored as a string. You want to get how many of that item is stored in your inventory, so how would you go about doing it? Well, again, with the information that I've taught you so far, you might think to create a bunch of if statements to return different variables based on the string. Again, I think you can see how this is not a great system. Introducing tables. A table is a special structure that can be used to store data in many different ways. It contains things called key value pairs. You can think about it like a table you see in math or in Excel. On the left-hand column are the keys, and on the right-hand column are the values. This is an extremely adaptable format, so we can use it in many ways. One way to use a table is using it as something called an array. An array looks like this. It's like one of those pill containers that has days of the week on it, but instead of indexing by weekday, we index by number. So the first space is index one, the next one two, and so on. We can then put data into each one of these slots. Here's an example. I'll create a local variable called fruits. If you remember from part one, it's best to get in the habit of declaring your variables as local if you're not going to be using them anywhere else. Then, I'll assign it to this. This open bracket, close bracket syntax is how we create an empty table. Then, we can put something into the first spot by accessing it using square brackets, and putting a 1 in there to denote the first spot. Then, we can assign it to something. I'll assign it to the string orange. I'll add apple as a second element, and banana as a third element. If we visualize this as a table, it looks something like this. When you're storing things in a table with numbers as the key, starting from one and going up sequentially, this is what we would consider an array, which we can visualize like this. We can access those values that we stored by using the square bracket syntax again. If we print out the second element, we'll see that it prints out apple. The array is a very useful data structure, and we'll be revisiting this later in the video. The second main way to use a table is as something called a dictionary. Kind of like an actual dictionary, you can look up the word, in this case the key, and get its definition, in this case the value. Here's an example. Let's create a simple inventory. I'll create a local variable called inventory, and again, assign an empty table to it. Let's say we have seven wood. I'll use the string wood as the key and assign seven to it. I'll repeat this for some other materials. The table now looks like this. Like before, we can access the value, in this case, how many of a certain item we have, using the square bracket syntax. However, another way to access it is using this dot syntax. This converts whatever is after the dot into a string, and uses that as a key for the table. A third useful way to access the values is by just using a variable. Let me create a local variable called selected item, and set this to stone. Then, we can use that variable as a key, and print that result. If we change the value of selected item, you can see that the value we're accessing is different. I'm sure you can imagine some system where we change selected item when scrolling through our inventory to show how much of each item we have, which is much more extensible than creating a bunch of if statements. Be careful not to get the variable indexing and dot indexing mixed up. Dot variable is equal to this, not this. What if we want to update a value in our inventory? We can add one to the amount of wood we have, like so, or we can use an assignment operator, like so. Last thing for tables. For the values, you can put pretty much anything in there, even functions and other tables. Here's a common situation you come across in game dev. Let's say you need to do something repeatedly. I'll pull up our array of fruits again. This time, I'll create the array directly like so. I want to print out every fruit. You may think to just repeat the print statement multiple times. What if the number of fruits in the array changes? What if we have 100 fruits? This is where the concept of a loop comes into play. Let me show you something called the for loop. We first start off by writing for, and then we create a local variable to keep track of the index of the array. A common variable name is i. Then, we set this equal to the starting value. In this case, the first index is 1, so I'll set it to 1. Next, we put what the final value should be. This is where we can use the pound or hash sign again. If you remember from part 1, this operator can be used to get the length of a string. But, you can also get the length of a table as well. 
Finally, we put how much we want the index to go up each iteration. In some cases, you might want to go up in a different increment, like increments of two, or maybe even backwards, so you use negative one. We want it to go up by one each time, so if you don't include anything, it will default to one. End the line with do, and then finish it off with an end. I'll just print i to show you what it's doing. You can see that essentially i gets set to one, then whatever is in the for loop gets executed, and then it repeats, incrementing i when it repeats. And then it continues until i is equal to the length of the fruits array. Let's print out fruits here instead, but use i as the key. This is not only useful for iterating through arrays, but any sort of thing that needs to be done many times. We make sure to stop at the length of the array, because if you try to index on a key that doesn't exist, you'll get nil. We can see what happens if we change the array. Let me add 60 pineapples to the fruits array. I can do that by making a for loop, and then setting the final value to be 60. Then. Inside of the for loop, I use a special table function. We can call table.insert, then put the fruits table as the first argument and the thing we're trying to add as the second argument. This adds pineapple to the end of the array. There are a few other table helper functions. For example, remove, that removes an element, and sort, that sorts the array. But I won't be going into that in this video. Let's call the other for loop again. And you can see that it prints everything, since the change in the length of the array is reflected here. Keep in mind that i is considered a local variable, so it will not exist outside of the for loop. Okay, so this works for going through an array, but what about something where the keys are not numbers? In this case, we can use something called a generic for loop, also known as a for each loop. I'll create our inventory example again. Similar to the array, you can create a table directly with data like so. I'll create a generic for loop by writing for followed by one variable, k, which will contain a key. Then we write in pairs and pass in our table. Then, like the for loop, just finish it with a do and an end. I'll print out both the key and the value using some string concatenation. And you'll see that k is set to the keys of the table in order, and we can get the value from the key. With the SDK, you also have this handy print table function to dump all of the contents of your table into the console. There's also a while loop, a repeat loop, and another generic for loop using pair instead of i pair. But I'll leave that as an exercise to you if you're interested in exploring those options. Finally, let's get into some playdate specific stuff. If you go to sdk.play.date, you'll reach the playdate specific documentation. If you jump down to the API reference, you'll see that the playdate SDK offers a collection of a lot of helpful features that handle common game development related tasks, like drawing things to the screen under graphics, playing audio under sound, and getting player button input under button. I would encourage you to skim through it to see what's available. The question is, how do we use any of these APIs? Everything pertaining to the playdate is under the playdate global variable, and you can access specific things using the dot notation. You can think of playdate as essentially a giant table. You can see from the autocomplete suggestions of available functions and variables. However, there are some optional helper libraries that require you to import them in first. Big ones are graphics, for drawing, sprites for using the Playdate's super useful sprite system, timer for timers, and object for object-oriented programming. I usually just import these four by default in all of my projects. I won't be going into specifics, but one important thing I want to cover is the update function. Whatever in the update function gets called every frame, so by default, that's about 30 times a second. In most games, this is going to be the heart of your game logic. This allows you to execute game logic repeatedly instead of having it run once and be finished. Next week, I'll be going over how to make a simple game from start to finish. Subscribe so you don't miss it. Another video that I think you should watch is my getting started with the Playdate SDK video. Even if you already set up the SDK, I go over making a small example game. Next, I would watch my video on using sprites to draw everything and also my video on object-oriented programming. Those last two were made with somewhat intermediate developers in mind, so don't worry if it's a little confusing. However, I think they'll overall be helpful to get an idea of those concepts. Thanks to my Patreon supporters for making videos like this possible, and see you next time.